Last night we just tried to lay a foundation about how Satan starts so early in our life trying to build strongholds in our mind, which means that he lies to us in areas and entrenches himself in our thinking or entrenches his lies and ideas into our thinking. So we live our lives believing lies, which then cause us to behave in wrong ways. So he does it to everybody, and then we all get out there and try to get along together, and it just becomes a real huge mess. The only hope for us is to have our minds renewed by the Word of God, learn how to think the way that God wants us to think, learn how to say what God wants us to say, so we can be what God wants us to be, do what God wants us to do, and have what God wants us to have. Everybody would say, yes, I want to have what God wants me to have. Well, you got to backtrack about several steps and start back over here with learning to think the way that God thinks. I guess a lot of people like me for a lot of years, I thought my thoughts didn't really matter. Didn't know I could do anything about them. Just whatever fell in my head was what I thought about. If I woke up in the morning, the thought came to me, I'm depressed and I would just go around and be depressed all day. Didn't even try to overcome it. Didn't think I could cast it down. And what a glorious day it was for me when I learned the truths that I'm trying to share with you that I actually did not have to meditate and think on everything that fell in my head, that I could cast that out and choose something else that would help me actually enjoy my day and live a good life. Now, in the beginning, it's a little bit difficult because we haven't practiced doing it. We've been rather passive and empty-headed and just kind of wait around to see what's going to fall in our head. But we're learning that now we can be aggressive and take the leadership role in doing our own thinking. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. We're going to take a look at this. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and became corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. So the first instruction from the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians was put off the old man. We know that the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away and all things become brand new. However, there's a cooperation that we have to give working with the Holy Spirit that although I now am a new creature, I need to put off that old nature. The next verse says, and be constantly, everybody say constantly. <laughs> and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. And the next verse, and put on the new nature, the regenerate self, created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So we see that we need to put off the old man, put on the new man. Stop living the way we used to live. Start living the way God wants us to live. And the bridge to get from one to the other is be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Where the mind goes, the man follows. It's impossible to have a positive life and at the same time have a negative mind. Can anybody say amen? amen. That's just not going to work, is it? Well, today what I want to teach you is, when is your mind normal? <laughs> what is really normal for a believer? You see, what's normal for the world is almost always not normal for us as far as looking at it in God's, God's economy. You know, there's a world economy, but there's God's economy. There's a way the world lives, but then there's a way that we are supposed to live. You know, the world worries, but we get to pray. So we don't want to pray and worry because then we're still back in both of those worlds. So we have to learn, when is it normal? It's not normal to worry for a Christian. When I say today it's not normal to worry, most of you would think, well, yeah, it's really normal to worry. Well, it shouldn't be for you. For you, that should just be like, well, that don't feel right. That don't feel good. That doesn't fit at all. Have any of you ever put on something to wear and found that you had a few more pounds on you today than you had the last time you wore it. <laughs> and 
it was just really, really, really tight. And you tried to wear it anyway. And it just made you miserable all day. Anybody ever had that experience? Okay. Well, that's kind of the way it is when we try to wear things or let our mind be in conditions that don't fit us as Christians anymore. You see, there are things when you become a believer that just doesn't look right on you anymore. It just doesn't fit with you anymore. Maybe an unbeliever could have that attitude and wear that attitude and talk like that, but it's not for you anymore. It's not right for you. Well, I for, it's kind of interesting because as you grow spiritually, you begin to know that, so you put off those attitudes, you put off those thoughts. And as I have matured in years also, one of the things that I will not do anymore is wear something that's uncomfortable. I cannot stand it. Not in the physical or in the spirit. So when, when is your mind normal? How should you be thinking as a believer? Well, first of all, I think that believers are supposed to have a made up mind. We need to know how to know what we want to do, make our minds up that we're going to do it, and not change it every few seconds. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind and keep it set on things that are above, not on things upon the earth, for you are dead and your real life is hidden with God in Christ. Set your minds and keep them set. Set your minds and keep them set. Set your minds and keep them set. Not set your mind and change it, set your mind and change it, set your mind and change it. You can make your mind up that you're going to clean your house up today and don't let anything change it. When somebody calls and says, let's go shopping, you can say, no, I've got my mind made up. I'm cleaning up my house today. Somebody calls and says, come on, I'll take you out for lunch. Nope, I've got my mind made up. I'm going to get my house cleaned up today. The only way that we can ever accomplish what we really want to accomplish in life the only way that we can be true to our true selves and follow our true heart desires is if we set our mind in the direction that we want to end up in. Where do you want to end up in life? Set your mind on that and stop changing it every time you turn around. It's amazing the victory that you can have and the things that you can do if you set your mind. And you can learn to do it or God wouldn't tell you to do it. People ask me... Um, Lots of interesting questions, but one I get asked is, well, how do you feel about all the travel you have to do to do what you're doing? And I say, I don't know. I don't think about it. I couldn't tell you how I feel about it. It would be dangerous for me to think how I feel about it. <laughs> because if I did, pretty soon I might not want to do it anymore. So I don't think about it. Why? Because I've already got my mind set that I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do as long as I'm breathing. <laughs> And I don't think about what it costs me or, you know, I have to be very careful if I get into thinking about how hard it is, which once in a while I'll go there if I'm really tired. So I've learned a few things over the years. And one of the things is, is you've got to set your mind and just don't even fiddle around with stuff. I decided almost six years ago that I needed to start working out, something I'd never done in my whole life. Didn't want to, didn't think I had time to, didn't care about being sore. That didn't want to do any of it. My husband has worked out for over 50 years, and that's one of the reasons why he looks so fantastic. Well, I did not work out. And one day I looked at myself in the mirror, and kind of everything that used to be up here had gone somewhere else. <laughs> and I actually really, for me, I can tell you, I felt like that I just had a real revelation from God that if you want to be strong for the last third of your journey, and if you want to finish what I've called you to do, then this is something you have to do. Yeah, you have to do it. Thank you. But even more, even more than it being about looking better, it's about being healthy. And, you know, we have all these joints and things because we're supposed to move. We're not supposed to just live on the couch or sitting in a chair or sitting in front of a computer. We're supposed to move. So I encourage you to just be as active as you can in worship because for some of you, that's all the motion you get. <laughs> But anyway, here's the point. I'll have people tell me, I hate to exercise. I hate to, can't stand going to the gym. Can't stand it, hate it, hate it. You know what? I think I like it, I'm not sure that I do. I don't ask myself, I'm just going. I've made my mind up, I'm going. 
I go Monday, Wednesday, Friday when I'm in town. If I've got a conference, I go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Well, at first my mind said, you can't go three days in a row. And then I thought, well, why can't I go three days in a row? I do other things three days in a row. I'll survive working out three days in a row. It's amazing the things that your mind tells you that will keep you from doing the things that God wants you to do. So I'm just telling you, make your mind up what you want to do and stop thinking it to death. The first kind of mind that's normal for the believer to have is a made-up mind. We need to have our minds completely renewed. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, very interesting scripture, it says that we are to let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we have the mind of Christ, that we do hold his thoughts, intents, and purposes. Well, what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? It means when you're born again, you also get a new spiritual mind, but you keep your old fleshly mind. Romans 8.5 says if you set your mind on the things of the flesh, you'll pursue the things of the flesh. If you set your mind on the things of the spirit, you'll pursue the things of the spirit. And then it says the mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Think about that. What is the mind of the flesh? It's when I get off into reasoning and I'm looking at things the way, world, the way the world looks at them and I'm not allowing any input from the Holy Spirit. You got that so far? The mind of the flesh, sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. You can't live off the top of your head. You can't live just according to what you think. You have to go deeper than that and learn how to sense and discern what God is saying in situations. But the mind of the Spirit, Romans 8, 6 says, is life and peace, both now and forever. So we have that mind in us, but it has to be developed. As long as we let the mind of the flesh stay stronger than the mind of the Spirit, we're really not going to change in our experience. The thing that I want for people is I want them to enjoy the life that Jesus died to give them. I'm finally doing that, but I wasted so many years of my Christian life not enjoying my salvation or enjoying God or enjoying myself or anything else because the devil was still ruling me because I didn't understand that a lot of what I was thinking was not in line with the Word of God. Amen? Now. Let me just say this to you. I'm not here teaching mind control. <laughs> to try to just teach people to think positively and speak positively without teaching them the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, salvation through Christ. Anybody can just decide to think positive or speak positive, and yeah, you will get a few results. But I'm not talking about getting a few results from some worldly principle. I'm talking about living the life that Jesus died for you to live. And not only that, anything that the devil comes up with, he only got it because it was God's idea first. And so God's the one who teaches us to think positive and talk positive, and because Christians were lazy about doing it, the devil stole it. So now he turns it into some weird, wacky, occult, new age, goofy thing that leaves God out of everything. But we're not going to let the world have what God gave us first. Amen? Amen? Let the same mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in, uh-oh, humility. Can we talk just for maybe three minutes about humility? A humble mind. Do you know that you cannot grow and I cannot grow in the Word? I cannot even receive the Word. You cannot receive the message that I'm sharing with you today if you don't approach it with a humble mind. You have to approach every church service you go to like, man, I need this. Oh, I need this. I need to hang on to every word. I need this. So if you sit down and hear what somebody's going to speak on and you think, oh, I wish so-and-so was here today because they really need this. <laughs> or have you ever been disappointed when a speaker told you what they were going to speak on because you thought you already knew all about that one? I have. No, not you. No, I know that. Well, not anymore. I need it all. 
I need everything. I need to be reminded every time I can be reminded. I need you to tell me over and over and over again. Only a humble mind can be taught anything. Only a person with a humble mind can receive correction. We have to want to grow. We have to want to learn. Romans 12, 3 says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Don't have an exaggerated opinion of your own importance. Now, I'm sure that's none of you, but maybe somebody watching by TV today. Maybe you have a little problem with this, and so we'll just kind of talk to you for a minute, because I know none of these people have a problem with that. We all just, we just have this beautiful, humble <laughs> mind. What's the first thing that happens when we don't have a humble mind and we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to? We start to look down on other people. We start to have a lot of judgmental and critical thoughts, which we're going to talk about in detail later. A humble mind is not a mind who thinks lowly of itself. God's not asking you to have a bad opinion of yourself. He doesn't want you to have a bad opinion of yourself. He wants you to value yourself. He wants you to see your gifts and your talents, your abilities. He wants you to love yourself in a balanced way. But he doesn't want us to think that we're better than anybody else. We're not better than anybody else. So you might be more highly educated than someone else, but that doesn't make you better than them. You might be able to learn faster than somebody else, but that doesn't make you better than them. I might be a better communicator than somebody else, but that doesn't make me better than them. Someone may be, when you get even into the realms of like, so you have a hundred artists. Well, maybe one's better than another. That doesn't make them better than each other in God's eyes. I love the scripture in Colossians that says, in Christ, all distinctions vanish. Don't you like that? No more male nor female, no more Jew nor Greek. I'll add to it a little, no more rich nor poor, no more doctor and ditch digger. We're all one in Christ. Amen. All one in Christ. First Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. A person with a humble mind can wait on God's timing. <laughs> a person with a humble mind doesn't have to say, well, God, I don't understand why you're not doing this. I'm ready for this. I need this. I want this. They can say, well, God, I've put my request before you, and I believe that you're going to bring it at just the right time in my life. I trust your timing in my life. So we want to start by having a humble mind. But now we need to move on to some other things. Chapter 9 in this book, Battlefield of Mind, deals with wandering, wondering thoughts. Our minds wandering around all over the place is one of the biggest problems that we deal with today. The world that we live in is absolutely filled with distractions. It's amazing how our minds have such a difficult time sticking with what we're doing. Let me read you a little story out of my book here. One day, Dave and I and another couple that were friends of ours were riding in the car together. And simultaneously, the other couple and myself heard Dave say, I bless myself. And we laughed and thought, well, what are you, what are you doing blessing yourself? And he said, well, I just sneezed and none of you said God bless you, so I just thought I'd bless myself. <laughs> so. Then we started talking about it, and I said, oh, I didn't even hear you sneeze. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was in the office in St. Louis. The man in the back seat laughed and said, well, I was in Florida taking care of some business. His wife laughed and said, I was in Dallas in my office handling a situation. So here we were, all four of us were in the same car, in the same place. Something, Dave sneezed, none of us heard him because the other three of us had all gone to three different parts of the country in our mind. Just a simple little example of how when your mind leaves, for all intent and purposes, you're not there. Your body's there. Now, this is why Satan works so hard to bring distraction. And let me just put in a little plug for church services. The pastors will love me for doing this, I know. This is why we should never get up and move around in a church service unless we absolutely have an emergency.
And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings when I say this, but honestly, to do it if you don't have a real dire need is really just downright selfish. And you probably don't realize that, but here's what happens. I can tell you what happens because I watch it. Sister Brown in the middle of row 14 decides that she needs a drink of water. So she gets up, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> Everybody from 15 back watches her go. <laughs> then they watch her come back. <laughs> then they watch her go back in the row. And here the pastor is, or or if it's happening at one of my conferences, I'm up here, I'm pouring my heart out to people. I'm trying to change their lives with a word. I've spent hours and hours studying and getting ready. And now everybody from row 14 back have left. <laughs> and gone to get a drink of water with Sister Brown. <laughs> they have now admired her hat. They have not liked her outfit. <laughs> they have sized her up one side and down the other. They have all wondered where in the world she's going and what she's doing. <laughs> we live in an age of distraction. Riding down the highway is like taking a drive in an encyclopedia. Do you have any idea how many advertisements are stuck in our face in a five minute drive? We can't enjoy the scenery anymore because everywhere we look, there's another thing. <laughs> another thing being advertised. I remember when television was so simple, the show, first show I ever watched was Howdy Doody. <laughs> it shows you, I was around when television first came out. And uh, you had one little short, maybe, I don't know, 30 second ad in the middle of the show, and that was it. <laughs> now it's like you, you just get interested and say, <laughs> honestly and truly, the world is not gonna change, so we better change. And one of my goals, and I've been working on it for a while, because I have an issue in this area too, I got a very busy mind, I got a lot on my plate, got a lot going on, and, uh, I find it challenging to keep my mind on what I'm doing, but I've really been working with God on that for a long while, and I'm still working on it because we get ourselves in a lot of trouble, and we miss a lot of beautiful things that God has for us by simply not keeping our mind on what we're doing. Do you have any idea how much more you'll get out of this today if you can really lock in and absorb every single word that's being said? A couple, well, about uh, six weeks ago, I tripped up a set of steps that happened to be stone, and I cut my arm up, still got some scars here because of that, hit my knee, and also fractured my big toe. Now, I went through a lot of pain, a lot of time, had to go to the foot doctor, had to do this, had to do that, all because while I was going up the steps, I wasn't at the steps. I was already out in the kitchen doing what I was going to do when I got there. My family has to really watch me because I'm usually like one step ahead of where I'm at. And the other day, I was driving into our subdivision. I was, somebody else was driving and I was riding in the back seat into the subdivision. And I started thinking about what I was gonna do when I got home. And I actually got hold of the door handle and started to get out of the car and we were still driving down the street. So, a lot of accidents are caused by not keeping your mind on what you're doing. So let's start praying that God will really help us learn how to focus more deeply and better because we really need to learn how to enjoy what God is giving us to enjoy. We need to be able to focus. We don't comprehend things if we don't focus. Well, learning how to meditate on God's Word is the key to renewing your mind and learning to think like God thinks. And all that really means is that you roll the Word over and over and over in your mind. Take time to do this and experience the strong, intimate relationship that God desires to have with you. The more you know His Word, the more you're going to feel close to Him, 
You're going to begin to recognize when he's talking to you. You're going to begin to recognize when a thought coming into your mind is, has nothing to do with God and it's something that you need to avoid. Je kindertijd. Een tijd om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. En om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommigen van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meer malen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen... Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long.
dankzij Gods genade en de hulp van al die mensen wereldwijd die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je Gods stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.